So it has been a little over a month since the Promised Neverland manga came to a conclusion, and a lot of you have really wanted me to talk about it, more specifically how I feel towards its final arc and ending. So over the past week I dedicated time to read through it for the first time, continuing from where I left off which was pretty much the start of the arc. I have a lot of mixed opinions, and I believe so does the community, as the response for the finale wasn't inherently bad, but more so odd. I do feel there was a lot of weird steps taken and missed opportunities overall to instead create an ending that tiptoed on the line of being satisfying for the readers. Because of the shape the final arc took, there seems to be a big disconnect from characters, emotions, narrative flow, and even the framework of its story. The reason I put it in this light, in the sense of disconnection, instead of calling it outright bad, because a final arc structured this way would normally land on the side of a really big hit, or a really big miss. If it ever lands in the middle like this, it's usually because the idea behind the direction is good, but the steps taken or sometimes not taken create this weird void within the readers that makes them not really sure on how to feel. You want to recognize that it's a good ending, and you could probably see it in the distance, but you also can't help to feel that you've either been played, misled, or even just acknowledged that a mysterious something is missing. This could be one thing or many things that are missing. As much as it ends on an obnoxiously satisfying note that arbitrarily shreds any sort of importance that made any sort of decision making up to that point null and void, you can't help but feel somewhat uneasily satisfied, almost like you shouldn't be. So what we are going to do is take a closer look at the final arc and its ending, but more importantly how it fits within the framework of the entire narrative. I feel it's important to recognize the full structure of The Promised Neverland, as from the first chapter all the way to the last plays a vital role in building weight and context for this style of a finale to truly work. The seeds are continuously planted throughout the journey, and only start to sprout and even bloom towards the end. So it's important to see what fertilizes those seeds, and what variations of things it could give birth to. With the opening out of the way, let's have a look at the architecture for The Promised Neverland, and how its final block is a little off-centered in comparison to its whole structure. One of the most important things about The Promised Neverland is its opening arc, and how monumentally gripping it truly is. I'm not sure if the author and the artist expected such an overwhelming wave of support from it, as everything after it arguably never lives up to that same level of expectation. It's an extremely hard one to reach, so I don't necessarily blame them for that. But when you stand back and look at the narrative that comes after it, it completely evolves into something else entirely, and steps away from what drew people in to begin with. Now this isn't a bad thing, if anything the approach towards it is a pretty normal thing, but because that opening arc was so compelling, a lot of people really wanted that same familiarity continuing forward. Does it do this? Yes and no. The world opens up extremely quickly. A lot of characters are coming in and out of focus, and the danger levels are extremely high. But what the first arc raised the bar for, probably a little high in my opinion, was its level of dread, despair, and death. These three things fuel the first arc to give it that powerful zest, and when it's contrasted with bubbly, intelligent, lovable characters, you have that said addicting formula swirling within your bottle. Now normally you would take these things and expand upon it, as you explore and open up the world, as you're introduced to new characters and concepts, and while it does do this, it's unfortunately never to the same level, and over time even starts to reverse itself, as something rather ugly starts to appear in the distance, character immunity. One of, if not the biggest quote unquote problem that The Promised Neverland has is its character immunity, also known as plot armor. What this is, if you didn't know, is a normal concept used within narratives to give safety armor to specific characters to easily traverse plot situations. For example, and depending on what your structure is, killing off your main character would obviously end your story, so the more dangerous events, fights, and situations they get in can sometimes mean nothing, because you know as a reader they aren't going to die. Now the job is to make that plot armor as invisible as possible, and it's very easy to do with a singular main character. Almost every story you come across has this as a normal thing. The beauty lies with how well the author makes you think the characters could die at any moment even with that said plot armor, to the point where you forget about it. 
This is a bare minimum example. There is an endless number of things that weave directly into this to transform anything and everything in a variety of different directions. It's never this simple. This is the glaring issue the Promised Neverland has after its first arc. As it continues to expand and bleed into different concepts, the character immunity starts to become a lot more visible, and you can't help not to compare it to its flawless utilization within the first arc. It becomes even more prominent with the amount of people that actually have it, with side characters and the children all having a good dose the further you progress. It's a weird thing that has to be balanced extremely well, and unfortunately it's elevated through Emma's outgoing mindset, where she will continuously take high risk gambles that go her way a majority of the time with what seems to be no actual consequences. All of this is backed on heavily before you even reach the final arc, but when you actually get into its reverse narrative spike, where it opens up with a rather high strung tense moment and dwindles down, nothing truly feels at risk. To poorly season that even more, a majority of things either feel rushed or loosely approached. The biggest one for me being the demon society and its politics, more specifically the encounter with the queen. On the contrary, I found this whole situation to be rather engaging. The Queen was interesting, they had strong politics and beliefs to weave nicely within, and the emotion was extremely high. However, it's very loosely handled, and starts to fall back onto that character immunity for a variety of different people that don't actually need it. This is the backhand slap that hits you in the face, as only prior moments before, you see this queen absolutely obliterate other demons with power and speed. Yet up against humans, even in a more evolved and dangerous form, she amounts to almost nothing. Undoubtedly, there's strong emotions behind it that manage to carry it through, and this will be a recurring theme for the final arc. But everything she represented was gone in a matter of seconds. Her threat level dropped completely and the risk factor for characters dying was non-existent. If this powerful queen couldn't kill one human individual, why would I expect any other person to fall from a lower threat? This is unfortunately what the beginning of the finale sets in motion, and it's probably the worst thing you could accidentally do, to take away that tension or suspense for every situation that follows. It also doesn't help how flip-floppy every character feels. Norman had a rather strong portrayal of conviction, and went above and beyond to push for a different future, yet was convinced and reverted because of Emma's normal and typical gamble of fate. Mind you, what Emma done to convince Norman was nothing new. She's actually done it multiple times before with no avail. She's actually done it with pretty much every decision she's ever made that has some sort of consequence, which in return makes those consequences feel like nothing because she always manages to come out on top. It's a hard thing to get behind when you know everything is going to be all right because Emma said so, and that all the issues, problems, and situations will get swept under the rug without any penalties being paid in full. The only saving grace for me is what feels to be the genuine emotion behind everything that pushed itself to be authentic, even though a lot of situations could have been 10 times more powerful and intense than what was actually given. Take everything that I've talked about so far, chop it up and stretch it out over the remaining of the arc, but at a lower cost and risk, which aggressively plateaus everything. The last chapter, however, is where you finally get to see the consequences for everything that's happened. The massive deal Emma made to ensure safe passage for her friends and family to return to the human world. Or so you thought. The best example I could give for this situation is if you killed off a character and it was emotional and well done, only for that character to immediately return as a ghost and remain within the story as a main character. This is what I would call forcing a middle ground, where you still see the penalties, but they are immediately withdrawn and made void. To put simply, the cost that Emma pays is all of her memories, and she's forced to live alone within the human world without her friends. They eventually find her, realize she doesn't remember who they are or even what happened, but they still thank her, which shakes up her emotions and feels pseudo-connected to them. And by the end of it, she still doesn't remember who they are, but realizes they are important to her, at least emotionally, and decides to live with them and break free of the fate she was given. Once again, emotionally this works. On the surface, it's a beautiful scene, but it feels completely pointless and shallow the deeper you go, and that comes off the high tension, dangerous, deathly final arc that has no risk or consequences whatsoever throughout its entirety. 
It's funny now that I remember, they do actually throw a very forceful bone that honestly felt like it came out of left field, in the form of a prominent death. Yet the way this character dies is honestly disrespectful, and doesn't even take place within the actual tension of the arc. It happens between events. I'm not going to lie, writing out this script made me realize just how solemnly disappointed I am, only because I know just how incredibly powerful that final arc could have been. Everything is set up for it to be that way. Some moments, events, encounters, and emotions are handled nicely. Yet it seems like they either chucked everything out the window, or wanted an easy conclusion that someone played the whole field with superficially satisfying everyone. I tried my best to frame this video away from being straight negative. I don't want it to seem like I'm hating on this series because I didn't get the ending I wanted or something. If you enjoyed what the finale gave and what it done, that's perfectly fine. I'm happy you had that reception for it. For me, it lays to rest in a very odd place, where I can see its flaws and misdirections, but still manage to conclude things successfully. As I mentioned at the beginning, a finale like this is extremely difficult to pull off, and it's 100% handled better than a lot of other series that try and do similar things, even if itself couldn't reach its own promised Neverland. To bring this video to a conclusion, let me know how you feel about the finale of The Promised Neverland. Did you have similar issues to myself, or something else that didn't sit right with you? For what it's worth, I enjoyed the journey it gave, and will remember its opening arc as a sublime introduction to a manga. I'd love to hear your thoughts. With that said, I want to thank you all for watching, hope you enjoyed, drink plenty of water, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.